Up next, uh, we have a man who is responsible for contributing to improvements in performance, maintainability, and reliability of core features with, some s with a strong focus on state channels. Uh, he's one of the protocol developers of the project. And with this topic on getting started with, cha with state channels, it's Tino Bredin, but he's still getting ready. So, I'll try. okay, Tino, there we go. Please, a round of applause for Tino. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. The presentation got lost. <laughs> okay. So, uh, as already mentioned in the introduction, I'm part of the state channels team. Um, yeah, with the core protocol developers team. And since my colleagues from the state channels team uh, present all the juicy topics tomorrow, I opted for some more high level introduction to core development and how others can get into core development. Now, the reason why I feel qualified to do that is uh, because of two things. One is um, I feel very strongly about uh, software where I work on should be approachable for other developers who might not have the same skill set. And especially for an open source project like Eternity, as Emmy mentioned this morning, um, which really draws from the sustainability in terms of open source, it's important that in the future the core team can expand and also others who are not part of the core team can actually contribute to such a project. So making it approachable is really important. The second reason why I'm, in, why I'm qualified is because um, when I initially got into Eternity, um, I had to port it to Windows just before the mainnet launch. <laughs> so as you can imagine, with 100% of core developers using Mac OS or, and Linux, it was quite hard to uh, port the whole full node to Windows. And I got to see some dark corners of the build system and such, um, but we batted through, and uh, this way I can actually share this, this knowledge I acquired. Right, so who, who should care? Obviously, core protocol developers or want-to-be core protocol developers will care about how to get into um, the core development. But likewise, I believe that also developers who uh, live higher up the stack when it comes to the Eternity ecosystem, um, they should actually look into the core as well. And most importantly, people who build businesses on top of Eternity, startup founders. Now, unfortunately, I believe I'm on the wrong track here because all the startup founders are in another room, but uh, maybe they will look at the slides anyway. But I think if I were to build a startup on top of Eternity, um, I would feel very anxious if I didn't know what's going on in the core and how the core is proceeding, what new features are being discussed. We heard um, the talk by Sasha earlier about governance. So I would want to be really involved in all of this, even though I might not be the technical guy who's then implementing stuff. So that's why they should actually look into this as well. So during my talk, I'm gonna dive down into a little bit of detail from really high up into kind of the do's and don'ts of when to get into eternity, what to do and what not to do. So let's start with a really high view of what the core within Eternity actually is. So obviously on the bottom we have the protocol, the specification of what does Eternity do as a platform, which APIs are there, and how do they all work together. And this is where Sasha does a lot of work, but also the core development team does a lot of specification work likewise. And then comes the core already. So the core is what others refer to as the full node, or what you will find on GitHub as Eternity. And that's basically a set of components running which implement the protocol specification and act as the reference implementation nowadays. So in the future, there might be many implementations of Eternity. Right now, there's one. And then on top of that, and I actually didn't mention everything which puts on top of it, it's really just an example. There are the SDKs, like the Go SDK or the JavaScript SDK. Then there are the base, there is the base app and all the apps which will follow or which are already there. Obviously, they build on top of each other and everything kind of relies on the core. So if I were to kind of work on the top layer, work on an app, which might be the basis of my business idea, and I wouldn't know what's going on in the core 
then that's a huge risk factor to me because I don't really know what's going on the foundation of my business, right? So if anything changes in that core and I'm not aware of it, that could actually kind of have a big impact on my business. So that's why I think lots of people should actually care about what's going on in the core. And as we've just seen, um, well, we use Erlang quite a bit. I won't try to explain to you what Erlang is better than Robert just did, so um, we'll leave it at that. But the implementation of the core is to 99% Erlang and then a little bit on top in other languages. So it's really important to understand that Erlang helps us quite a bit in achieving all those high-flying goals, which we always discuss about, because we can actually focus on it. And Erlang takes away the need to handle these auxiliary tasks like how to run a scalable system or how to leverage many cores. So that's all taken care of. And um, yeah, and we can focus on the real goal. Going a little bit deeper. Now, I don't think you can judge the complexity and the effort of software in lines of code. Um, and many people, especially my colleagues, subscribe to that sentiment. But I'm going to do it right now anyway and give you a couple of numbers just to highlight what kind of complexity we're actually talking about. So when you look into the core implementation right now, we have roughly 90,000 lines of code within the full node. We're talking about 60,000 lines of code when it comes to testing. So all of the tests which Tinsha is running 5,000 hours during a given month, or was it week? I don't remember. <laughs> so that's kind of a lot of test code. And then there are also dependencies which we might not directly develop, but we depend upon. And that's another 100,000 lines of code. So all in all, it's 250,000 lines of code, which you kind of have to grasp. And that's a lot of stuff to read. So for a single developer, that has vastly exceeded already the capabilities to kind of keep that in your head, right? to keep a mental model of what the full node actually implements in a certain amount of detail in your head, right now it's already way too much in that. And the complexity is really, really condensed. So we hear lots of talks during today and tomorrow about fantastic features, about concepts where we might have the only implementation right now, like in the blockchain world. So this is some really difficult stuff. And all of that is crammed into 90,000 lines of code. So these lines of code pack quite a punch. So if you were to sit down over the weekend and read all of that code because you're a really fast reader, you might come out of, the, of this weekend and don't know anything about how eternity actually works, right? Because there's so much detail in there, which makes it really hard to understand in a short period of time. And that's also why if you were to make a change or if you would want to get into it, you better know what you're doing because any little change can have an impact down the line, maybe not tomorrow, but in a month from now, which you might not even foresee it. So digging a little bit deeper, those 90,000 lines of code obviously are split up into many different apps. So in Erlang, we call those applications, and applications are all bundled together into a system, which we then call the core node. Um, there are many apps in the Eternity node, and each of these apps kind of has a different um, yeah, presentation through the next two days. So I won't, don't want to talk about these, but they're highly condensed. Most of them implement only one specific feature, Right? So that's why we have apps like the AENS, which is the naming service, or AE Stratum, which implements most of the Stratum logic, and AE Fate, which is the virtual machine which we heard about earlier. And then there's the important stuff to the right, you see that here, which is kind of the cross-cutting concern of any software system. 
stuff which you need to maintain it, build it, and get it to run. So there we have the build system, the test framework, and the CI system. And I want to focus on these three things because it's really important as a developer to get to know these processes before diving into source code. So let's look into the details of the build system. Luckily, within the Eternity node, we use standard tooling. So if you ever looked into an Erlang system, um, you might find yourself very familiar with what's going on in our code base. So there's lots of make files. There's something called rebar 3, which I'm going to describe. And then there's bash. So you, most of you know bash, most of you know make files. Rebar 3 is a little bit specific to Erlang. It's a build system which many Erlang apps use and which allows you to not worry about how you actually build an Erlang file or an Erlang application. It takes care of that um, through a very simple configuration. However, taking all of these tools together creates complexity. So if it were only make files, we probably wouldn't have a problem to understand it. Rebar on its own is also very simple. But in a system like Eternity, we combine these three tools over multiple layers. So that means in the end, you might not know what's happening five or six layers into the build system when rebar fails or a bash script fails, which was originally called by rebar, and then another make file in between. So it becomes really complex really fast. And that is also the reason why we try not to touch it too much during development. And the build system itself is also one of the reasons why porting Eternity was so hard um, to do for Windows, because there are lots of assumptions in there which we have in our daily development life. But truth be told, now it's in a pretty good shape. Um, there has been a lot of cleanup, so for new developers, it should be quite easy to get started. Then there's a the test framework. And what I mean by test framework is actually a collection of different test tools, as well as test suites, which all have a different purpose. And after all, we're talking about 60,000 lines of code, so it's really not just a singular test which we've written, but many more. So when we start from the top, each of the applications within Node has its own test suite, or even many test suites. And these live in the applications themselves. Most of these test suites are unit tests, integration tests, so they are comparatively easy to get into. They don't rely on a lot of state outside of the test. So if you were to develop a new feature, you might just have to find the right application, find the right test suite, add your new cases, and then you could start out developing. It becomes a little bit more complex when we're talking about system tests. System tests are tests which rely on data a lot which rely on systems talking to each other. And since we have a peer-to-peer -peer system, um, these system tests actually have to do a lot of setup already. So those are also the tests which have quite some complexity in themselves. Um, and most of the time, you might not even have to touch them as a developer. But they're really important to have because especially during release building, you want to make sure that the system is still running under certain conditions which we might have found earlier are really like production-like or really important. We might even contain data which you know is critical that you get it right. And that kind of test lives obviously under what we call system tests, the directory system test. Then there's release tests which are even like one step further, they are system tests in themselves, but they do black box testing. So system tests might still look at eternity as a gray box, meaning we know what's going on inside and we know um, how we can introspect the system. And then in release tests, we say this is basically a black, black box. We don't care that it's implemented in Erlang. 
we only use APIs during testing and we throw a bunch of requests at it, right? And that's also really important that you not only do white box or gray box testing, but also black box testing. And to make matters even more difficult, those are not even implemented in Erlang, but in Python. <laughs> so now you have to understand Python a little bit. And then um, to kind of get back to my colleague, Thomas Arts, um, we also have quick check models. So as Thomas mentioned earlier, he's working testing a lot and he has also developed this system called QuickCheck, which does property-based testing, meaning you work on a model instead of specific test steps. So you model your system, and this way you are able to verify that the target of your tests actually works as previously modeled. So these tests live in a different repository, and we actually have models for various subsystems in the attorney to know it itself, not all of them. Um, and these also uh, contain quite a lot of complex knowledge about how certain subparts work. As a new developer, you, you probably go from top to bottom in these kind of tests. So you won't start quick checking stuff because that alone is already quite difficult. Most developers will start unit testing, then system testing, then release testing, and that's actually what Dinshaw is really interested in. And after all, at some point, you might do quick checking. And finally, since we were talking about releases already, we have a fantastic continuous integration system, which uh, is running continuously. We check every commit. There's lots of feedback going on. All the target platforms are being checked, and that's really important. So, for instance, when I did the porting to Windows, the continuous integration was essential because I had to touch pretty much every subsystem and subcomponent of the Eternity node. I had to change lots of build configuration, lots of like little tiny details of how the file system is being accessed. And all of that would have crashed basically the build on other platforms if it weren't for the continuous integration system. So it's a really good safety net for new developers. So if you want to just try out a certain configuration maybe, you would go in, put that into a commit, push it to a branch, and then the continuous integration system just makes sure that it's still working through all the tests on all the platforms. So you don't even have to compile stuff on your machine anymore, <laughs> right? Just do the change, push it into a branch, and the continuous integration system will take care of it. Obviously, if it's all red, nobody's going to help you. <laughs> so, um, coming to kind of, so if you've kind of understood the basics of how to build the Eternity node, where tests are located, you might even have written a test, then it gets into um, the specifics and maybe the pitfalls of the combination of these systems. And this is where, for instance, Rebar comes into play again. I mentioned it earlier. Rebar 3 is the build tool for Erlang, which we use, and actually probably 99% of all Erlang systems use. However, Rebar can be complicated. So that's why I tell people they shouldn't get fancy with it meaning don't over-configure rebar. Use kind of the basic functionality and then anything which overcomplicates stuff, which is not compiling Erlang, should go out of rebar. Either do it before rebar or after rebar. Just not as part of rebar. And we've seen that in the, in the Eternity nodes configuration multiple times where because the configuration of rebar is very powerful, we've done a lot of things with it. We try to be really smart about um, telling rebar that it should do additional stuff, uh, but then the problem is whenever something fails, you don't know where to start debugging because rebar can be very obtrusive in that sense. So make sure to 
mostly not touch the rebar configuration, do your stuff outside of it, and just use it uh, to compile Erlang code, and then you're fine. Uh, my second point is, you should not add more dependencies to the system. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's already 90,000 lines of code, and we have 100,000 lines of additional dependency code already. So that means we depend on lots of stuff, which we might not even have checked and we might not even have insight about. And uh, given 90,000 lines of code which we've written, there's likely to be the um, logic already in there which you might need. So oftentimes, if you really think about it, a new de dependency might not be needed. Right? It might sometimes it's even easier to re-implement stuff, even though lots of people will tell you you should not re-implement logic which you can't get from somewhere else. Taking a new dependency into your system also means you actually have to start owning up to it. So if there's an issue in that dependency, you actually have to take care of that as well. And especially for, uh, for, for cross-platform development, new dependencies are always a breaking point. And for Eternity, for instance, one of the issues of porting it to Windows were mainly dependencies. So once we got rid of the build issues, there were still dependencies, mostly C dependencies, obviously, which were really hard to port. And also, they were really critical. So we use Libsodium for crypto, we use RocksDB for data storage. So all of a sudden, we are not talking about porting what we've built, right, the Erlang code, which we know really well, but we are talking about porting code built by others. And if they never thought about porting it to Windows, then that's kind of a deal breaker already. So, preferably, don't add any new dependencies, work with what we've got, and then you should be good. And lastly, what you should not do is getting discouraged. Um, obviously, with a system like Eternity, which is already quite big, it can be quite taunting for new developers to kind of get into. So if you've added your first change, um, added your first test suite, look at whether it's building and testing, and then everything breaks down. Like I said before, the CI is showing red in every step. This can be discouraging, but you shouldn't get discouraged, because oftentimes it's actually easy to fix. Um, but obviously, with so much logic in place, you should not take the feedback from the test suites too harsh. Just keep on going, try to fix it, get in touch with others, and rinse and repeat. Now, what you should do, though, is leverage the test suite to its fullest. Right? And that means run it as often as you can, get to know the test suite in, in detail so you can actually run parts of it. Um, right now, the test suite, if you run it completely, on a good machine, clocks in at around 25 minutes. Um, so you might not want to run everything completely, only the parts you really care about. So you have to get to know how, how that works. But if you do that, you can leverage a lot of test cases and a lot of test code which others in the team have already thought about. Um, so you should really get to know how to do that. Then there's lots of documentation in the repository itself. And I often see people asking questions in the forum so, um, about, let's say, how to install the node on Ubuntu or Debian. Um, and normally, we refer to them to the documentation which we have in the repository. Uh, so if you spend a couple of minutes as, a, as a, your initial getting started, um, there's lots of stuff in there which will help you to run the node to understand how configuration works and, and then get you going a lot faster. And then obviously, although maybe that's not too obvious for many newcomers to the code, you should actually talk about problems. So I think we made strides in terms of community communication when it comes to the core team engaging with the community and vice versa in the forums, for instance, but there's still a lot of improvement to be made. And uh, what I want to do is actually encourage newcomers to the core 
to talk about their problems. Because if you imagine, with so many brilliant minds working on the core, things can get quite complex quite quickly. So there might be a quick gap in between in terms of simplicity to get started and then the complexity of the project itself. And you kind of lose sight of that in the trenches when you work on it on a daily basis. So it's important to get that feedback from people new to the project to kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, maybe we went overboard a little bit with the complexity in a certain aspect and should invest more time in simplicity, be it for the build system or for the testing or what have you. So I definitely want to encourage people to maybe complain a little more in that regard, or at least point it out uh, in the forum, in the chat. There are a couple of team members who are really active in the chat. They seem to be on all the channels and uh, that should actually be taken advantage of. And if you do that, you get really fast feedback, and then maybe your initial complaint will actually lead to an improvement which will help others. So don't be discouraged and uh, just keep it for yourself because most of the time it might not even be a user error. So to kind of sum it up, there are lots of places to get started with the node itself, and everybody already knows the forum, hopefully. Um, I think within the core team, we've made a conscious decision to be more active when it comes to user communication. I myself, I'm definitely looking into the forum every day and try to find questions which I can answer, and I think we can still do better in that regard. Um, then there's our GitHub repository, which we've also decided to leverage even more. So right now, you might have seen the core development is going on in, or is being coordinated in Pivotal Tracker, and then we use GitHub for PRs and source code hosting. So that will be merged, and we'll do all the coordination in GitHub itself, which I think will help a lot in terms of visibility of what's going on and maybe we can even improve the governance after all, using that approach. There's the CI status, Dinsha showed us um, what that is looking like, which you can find on Circus CI. And as I mentioned, we should definitely try to get more bug reports. I think if we can encourage people to get to know the core, that will help us in the long run as core developers because bug reports will improve a lot. Um, since as a knowledgeable user, you will be able to pin down your issue a lot better than just saying, I cannot run the node, or uh, my configuration is not picked up, or anything like that, because you can already see where exactly that might happen. And that helps a lot when it comes to bug reporting and working on these. So. I hope some of you who haven't run the node yet are encouraged to run it tonight. And uh, if you find bugs, post them in the forum. I'll be happy to answer. Thanks. Yeah,